section, and I thought, wow, this is already somebody who is going to be a force in vision uh, field. And since then, I'm just watching her career exploding. So uh, we're delighted to have you today. And I will turn into uh, Arun to introduce you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Arun Mu, and I'm a researcher working with Dr. Paul Tsatsky. I'm pleased to introduce uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Goldus Manek, an associate uh, professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Pathology at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Manek received her PhD in vision science and physiological optics at the University of Alabama in 2002, and completed her postdoctoral training in ophthalmology at Duke University in 2006. After the postdoctoral fellowship, she studied the faculty positions in ophthalmology and pathology at U Duke University since 2006. She was given various awards for her remarkable research, uh, such as a Young Investigator Award from the Arkham Un uh, Research Institute, Institute in 2012, and Caroline McElroy uh, Memorial Award for Macular Degeneration Research from the Bright Focus Foundation. Her research uh, focuses on understanding the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms of age-related macular degeneration, especially in the regulation of AMD-relevant nuclear receptors and lipid metabolism, and ultimately identifying potential therapeutic targets. Today, she will be speaking about investigating potential therapies for AMD and the nuclear option. Please welcome Dr. Goldis Malik. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for that kind invitation um, uh, and that introduction. I I'm really pleased to be here. I've been, I've been joining these meetings as often as I can during the pandemic. And boy, have they been um, a, a nice relief uh, of being able to, to talk, see colleagues and, and talk science. So I'm, I'm really pleased that I'm giving this opportunity to speak with you today. So um, as the title, you can tell basically, uh, our lab focuses on trying to identify signaling pathways that are important in age-related macular degeneration. And for this, we're looking at a large family of transcription factors called nuclear receptors. So I don't need to go into this in too much detail, but age-related macular degeneration is a major culprit for vision loss in the elderly, and in particular, the, um, the individuals that are ready to retire. It is a complex disease, and this has been reflected um, by uh, the pathology that a physician see when they look into the back of the eye of a patient. And I'm just really showing you broad categories of what pathology, the pathology of AMD includes, which is early dry AMD, the accumulation of these lipid and protein rich deposits between the RP basal lamina and the intercollagenous layer of Brooks membrane, and late dry AMD where you have large areas of RPE that uh, degenerate, creating this geographic pattern, and then neovascular AMD where there are um, vulnerabilities in Brooks membrane that allow for vessels to grow from the choroid and the choroid capillaris underneath the RPE, and sometimes even interact with the retina, as is the case in retinal angiomatous proliferation. So, AMD in general has been a major focus of research for years, um, yet right now we have therapies for the neovascular form that are effective in a subpopulation of patients. There is light perhaps um, at the end of the tunnel for GA, so we'll see how the Apollos um, studies pan out, but there's still no therapies available for the early dry AMD phenotype which again is characterized by these deposits as well as changes in the choroid and the choroid capillaris. Well, AMD, part of the reason perhaps we don't have therapies is that it is a multifaceted disease. And this is um, illustrated by the number of risk factors that have been identified to date. Perhaps the most established one is older age, but as we know, there are also individuals who are younger who, who will develop Drusen. So, so we have to take that with, uh, with a grain of salt as well. But environmental factors, 
um, as well as socioeconomic and systemic health, specifically after sclerosis. These are all risk factors for the disease. And perhaps the area that's gotten the most attention is genetics where you can see genes that are involved in regulation of lipids, involved in um, complements, all play a major role in um, potentially increasing risk for development of AMD. So this risk um, list of risks, as well as the pathology that I showed you, and I'm very interested in pathology, so you'll see a lot of pathology in this talk today, um, have basically led to the identification of a number of pathogenic pathways that might be important in AMD. This is by no means exhaustive, but basically we're looking at ER stress, autophagy, lipid dysregulation, uh, lysosomal failure, um, et cetera. So again, why are there no treatments after all of these years? Well, one of the reasons may be that so far the treatments have really focused mostly on targeting known risk factors. And oftentimes they target only one risk factor. Another strategy may be to go in and try and identify what signaling pathways in cells that are vulnerable in AMD, including your RP cells, your parietal endothelial cells, your photoreceptors, what pathways are actually um, not functioning to their fullest potential as a function of age, and try and go in and rejuvenate, target those pathways, rejuvenate those cells, and make them young again. And this led us to look at a large family of transcription factors called nuclear receptors, precipitated mostly because these receptors have been shown to be regulators of various cell homeostatic pathways throughout the body. So just as a little bit of a background, nuclear receptors are the largest family of transcription factors in the human genome. They can be activated by a variety of molecules, including vitamins, lipids, and toxins, and perhaps most famously hormones. So they're oftentimes referred to as steroid nuclear receptors. But you, I, I'd like it for everybody to keep in mind that there's actually a subset of these nuclear receptors for which the ligands are not known. So uh, the steroid nuclear receptors is, is perhaps the older term, and we should keep a broader perspective when we talk about these receptors. As I mentioned, they regulate a number of physiological pathways. They're important during development, and perhaps a lot of the studies have focused on developmental stages um, of uh, what the nuclear receptors are doing. They are also regulators of inflammation and lipid metabolism, and they're linked to a wide range of diseases that share common pathogenic pathways with AMD, including neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and systemic diseases like atherosclerosis and diabetes. And the, the fun thing about nuclear receptors is if we identify a receptor that might be interesting and perhaps a, a therapeutic target for AMD, there are FDA-approved drugs available on the market, so that might help um, make the, uh, the movements to the bedside a, a little bit faster. So just to, to bring everybody on the same page, the activity of nuclear receptors is context dependent. It is found uh, throughout the body in endocrine organs and otherwise. But whether or not you activate the receptor or you don't, and whether or not it will have a beneficial effect or not, really depends on where you're targeting. And perhaps the best example is the estrogen receptor, where for certain breast cancers, if you target the estrogen receptor, activate the receptor, it is beneficial. But if you go and target it for perhaps osteoporosis or the bone, it can be detrimental. And this has led to a large study that's looking at selective modulators of the receptor. So taking into consideration, what is the, um, the target cell that you are, are trying to um, affect? The nuclear receptor gene family um, is, includes a total of 48 nuclear receptors. Again, it's the largest family of transcription factors. The ones you see highlighted in red are the ones for which FDA-approved drugs are available. And essentially, it has a DNA binding domain and a ligand binding domain. And upon binding to um, the ligand binding domain, Mechanistically, they can work either as homodimers, they can partner up with, an, with another nuclear receptor called, called RXR, or retinoid X receptor, or they can work as a monomer. So again, this, this all has an effect on whether or not downstream, they are um, increasing the expression of um, certain receptors or potentially repressing the expression of receptors. So since nobody had really looked at nuclear receptors in a comprehensive way, in the eye. There, there are a number of studies that have looked at it in the context of development, looking at one receptor or another, but not all of them together. We decided to start 
by creating a nuclear receptor atlas. And this is the work of uh, Mary Dwyer. She's a postdoctoral fellow that um, uh, basically spearheaded the study. The goal of the nuclear receptor atlas was to identify the expression of all 48 nuclear receptors. In, um, and specifically for this one, we focused on RPE cells, although since then we just completed one for choroidal endothelial cells. But the idea was to look at the expression of nuclear receptors in three model systems of RPE cells that at the time were prevalently, preva very prevalently used in the lab. One is the ARP19 cell line with all of its limitations. The other is a series of primary RP cell lines where we get the human donor eyes and we just isolate the cells and culture them. And finally, freshly isolated RP cells. And essentially, these are cells that have not been subjected to any culture conditions. And with that information, hopefully, we'd be able to link the function of these nuclear receptors with basic biology of RP cells, but also try and identify candidate receptors that may be important in studying in more detail to see if they play a role in um, disease. So essentially, this is the data. You can see that um, the, the top row is the expression in ARP19 cells, middle row primary RP cells, and the bottom row freshly isolated RP cells. And we bin them based on whether or not they were absent or low expressing, moderate expressing, and high expressing. And all this data is available on the Nuclear Receptor Signaling Atlas website. So with this information now comes which one do you want to study? And for this, we, we basically went to gene, uh, did some gene ontology um, searches as well as a, a broad search of the literature to identify what are some receptors that have been shown to play a role in AMD biologically relevant pathways. And this slide I'm showing you is just an example of some of them. So for example, are there receptors that have been shown to play a role in cholesterol um, regulation? Are there those that have been shown to play a role in mitochondrial function, maybe cell metabolism, angiogenesis? And indeed, there are a number of receptors, some of which the ligands are known and some of which ligands are not known. And over the last 15, 16 years or so, we, we've looked at a number of these receptors in detail, including the aryl hydrocarbon receptor that can be activated by a number of toxins, including toxins that are present in cigarette smoke. We've looked at PPARs, specifically PPR delta, that can be activated by oxysterols and how it may play a role in the overall um, structure of the retina. But for the rest of this talk, what I'd like to do is tell you two stories and they're interconnected. And the first one is gonna be um, uh, focused on the liver X receptor. And the second will be focused on NER1 and they tie together. So we got interested in looking at the liver X receptor because it is a master regulator of lipid metabolism and inflammation. Those are two major um, pathways that are important in AMD development. But beyond that, upon activation, there's an increase in the expression of target genes like ABCA1, CETP, APOE, and a number of other genes that have been shown to be associated with AMD. What we do know is that there are, it's not an orphan nuclear receptor um, as its ligands are known and they include some of the hydroxycholesterols, oxysterols, but we do know that these oxysterols activate the receptor at lower levels than um, certainly the, the chemicals that are available out there and the drugs that are available out there. And there is a nice study by Raj Opta and his colleagues that showed that treatment with a synthetic LXR agonist as an eye drop in an animal model of CMV actually improved cholesterol efflux capacities, um, mainly through uh, monocytes and macrophages. And most recently, there's been a study looking at the liver X beta receptor knockout mouse, and they found that, there, that it's associated with changes in the optic nerve. And what I would like to point out that I didn't earlier is that LXR basically comes in two flavors. There's an alpha isoform and a beta isoform. So we asked the first question as to what happens to LXR expression with age. And the rest of the data I'm gonna show you on LXR was primarily driven by Mayur Chaudhari, who's a very talented um, senior research associate in my lab. Basically, he took freshly isolated RPE cells and looked at the expression of LXR alpha and beta as a function of age and saw that there was a decrease in, excuse me, there was a decrease in the expression of LXR with age. And when you zoom into the AMD risk group, in other words, 50, 60 years and older, that increase continues, that decrease continues. Looking at LXR beta, 
a similar pattern emerges. There's a decrease in the expression of LXR beta as a function of age. It kind of plateaus when we get into this um, uh, AMD risk range. So this was one of the first differences that we saw between LXR alpha and beta. I should point out that LXR beta is fairly ubiquitously expressed throughout the body. We looked at the expression of LXR um, alpha as well as um, beta and its binding partners, the RXR, um, RXRs, looking at different parts of the retina, um, including the neural retina, firstly isolated RP cells, ARP19 cells, primary RP cells, and choroid, and basically saw that at least with regards to the expression, the machinery is, is there. And so one would assume that it can be activated in these cells. But what about AMD? Here I'm showing you cross sections from non-AMD aged donors. The staining for um, LXR alpha is in red, and you can see there's a fairly um, good representation of LXR, not only in the RP cell layer, but also throughout the, um, the, the neural retina. You can see this in the inner segments and the um, outer nuclear layer, and even within the outer plexiform layer. When we look at the AMD samples, however, it does seem like the expression of L um, LXR decreases in the neural retina, as well as decreases in the RPE. And when we look at this large confluent druse, um, we can actually see that there are these cores that are immunoreactive for LXR. And perhaps this is seen better when we use a fluorescent marker here um, in these panels on the right. So LXR is dysregulated in AMD and it's expressed in RPE cells. Can it be activated? The activity of LXR and all the other receptors, as I mentioned earlier, is highly dependent on what agonist you use. So we wanted to test a couple of agonists and determine which one is the best for our, our studies going forward. The two agonists that we decided to use are the GW compound and the TO. Basically, we take primary RP cells, and this is an older cell line. So that means the LXR expression in the cell line is not as high as it is in younger ones. But we needed to do this in older cells to see whether or not there's sufficient LXR to begin with to actually um, warrant uh, potentially activating the receptor as a therapy. So we transfected these cells with a plasmid reporter that has a response element and then a luciferase readout. And if you look at the these two, um, columns, the ones with the checkered board and the, the dot, you can see that when we activate the receptor, there's a really nice increase in the activity. We don't see that with our LXR at antagonist. And if we knock down the receptor, we see a decrease um, in uh, LXR activity as expected. Its ability to uh, be activated, that's one thing, but its ability to actually initiate transcription is another. So we looked at a couple of target genes, fatty acid synthase and SREBP1. And again, just focusing on the checkerboard versus the um, dotted versus uh, DMSO treated or antagonist treated, you can see that the expression of these target genes go up nicely. So the LXR pathway, it can be activated in RPE cells. And we've done this for choroidal endothelial cells and a similar pattern emerges. Well, with this, given that we saw a decrease in LXR expression as a function of age, we turned to Peter Tontinos at UCLA and um, asked to, to get several cohorts of LXR knockout mice. So we got cohorts of LXR alpha, beta, and the double knockouts to look at the ocular phenotype and to see what's happening in a little bit more detail ex vivo uh, looking at the retina. And here you can see the retinal function in the aged LXR knockout mice. These mice are um, about 12 months and older. Uh, the black line is the wild type mouse. Blue is the LXR beta and red is the LXR alpha and, B, and um, purple is the, L is the double knockout. And what you can see is that the scotopic A wave amplitude, the B wave amplitude, as well as the photopic B wave amplitude is perhaps the worst for the double knockouts as we would expect. Second worst is that um, for the LXR alpha. Interestingly, when we looked at the C wave amplitudes, we also saw a decrease in C wave amplitude for the LXR alpha. So all this is kind of pointing us towards looking at the LXR alpha in a little bit more detail. And then in collaboration with Raj Apta at um, WashU, we looked at dark adaptation and looking at normalized sensitivity as a function of time, we actually didn't see a big difference. However, there did seem to be um, an LXR dependent uh, change in the recovery rate uh, 
at the lower time points, at the earlier time points for um, in the absence of LXR. And this is something that we need to pursue in a little bit more detail, but haven't had a chance to do so. Looking at in vivo imaging, uh, we looked at fundus images as well as OCT images. Here I'm showing you just um, four different eyes from 12 months all the way to 27 months. And um, the distinction being that when we looked at the LXR alpha knockout mice, we could actually image the back of the eye. However, with the LXR beta mice, it was interesting because they all developed, the majority of them developed stellite cataracts. So it was really hard to see what's going on in the back of the eye. Um, but no worries, because we could take these eyes out and look at them on cross-section. And here I'm showing you cross-sections from aged wild-type mice versus LXR alpha, LXR beta knockout, and double knockouts. And when we looked at the overall architecture of the retina, nothing really stood out. And in fact, we did spidergrams, and there weren't significant differences between the layers, the thickness of the layers, which was surprising because we did see changes in the, in the retinal function. We did a handful of staining. It was not comprehensive as it, as it will be hopefully in the future, looking at RG-opsin, rhodopsin, as well as um, some of the secondary neurons looking at PKC-alpha and crowd bp When we looked at the wild type versus the LXR-alpha knockout mice, nothing really stood out as different. So we took a step back and said, why not look at, focus on the C-wave amplitudes? And let's look at the RPE Brooks membrane chorate interface in a little bit more detail. And so here you can see um, transmission electron micrographs from wild type mice, really focusing on that basal side of the RPE, the interface of Brooke, uh, Brooks membrane, as well as the chorate capillaris. You can see it has a beautiful morphology. Um, basal unfoldings look normal. Uh, Brooks membrane looks normal. When um, LXR alpha has been knocked out, however, there's this accumulation of sub-RPE deposits. It has this confetti-like material that um, Christine Curcio has, has described in the past. And you can also see that the basal infoldings are disrupted. The LXR beta mice, in the absence of LXR beta, they also develop these sub-RPE deposits. But interestingly enough, they also develop um, lipids, lipid droplets within the RPE. And as one would expect, the LXR alpha beta knockout mice basically are a mashup of these two with large lipid droplets within the RPE and sub-RPE deposits below. So we, we interrogated the composition of these deposits a little bit more detail by using histochemical stain, looking at oil of Bordeaux. It's been shown that um, neutral lipids accumulate in Brooks membrane as a function of age. And here you can see in the LXR alpha, there's a fair bit of oil of uh, histochemical stain in the RPE and below the RPE. The LXR beta take on more of this globular, um, uh, this globular staining and even more so in the LXR alpha beta knockout. And it kind of corresponds to what we're seeing on TEM. Looking at this um, staining for apolipoprotein E as well as EO6, which is oxidized phospholipids, we can see that below the um, Below the RPE, there is apolipoprotein E that accumulates as well as um, EO6. Okay, I don't know why these showed up and I'm not sure how to get rid of it, so we'll just keep going. Um, I mentioned that I, I love uh, pathology, so we decided to do a collaboration with um, Jeff Roberti because in the past, um, Christine Curcio and Mark Johnson and Jeff Roberti showed that uh, using a technique called quick free steep etch, it's an electron microscopy technique, you can actually identify what look like lipid uh, lipoprotein particles in the back of the eye. And this is uh, proposed to be one of the sources of the lipids that accumulate in Brooks membrane and below the RPE. So that's what we did. This was a very fun project because nobody had done this in mice before. So we had to create first a map of what quick, quick uh, what the back of the eye would look like with quick freeze deep etch in normal mice before we could do it in um, in uh, the, what we consider to be uh, vulnerable and damaged um, retinas or diseased retinas. And I just want to bring your attention to these, uh, and we could talk about this as if anybody is interested. Um, but I just want to bring your attention to these three pictures, these panels down here. This is essentially the outer collagenous layer. So it's a break, you freeze the tissue and then you break the tissue. Um, this is a break where you can see the outer collagenous layer, the basal infoldings, and here is a just a portion of Burke's membrane. 
and the LXR knockout mice, and this is normal, and the LXR knockout mice, you can see these round lipid-like spherical particles um, that are approximately 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter. And here's another region in an LXR knockout mouse that's normal. And again, this is very reminiscent of what um, Christine has, has reported in, um, in, in aged eyes and the lipoprotein uh, particles. So we think we, we have um, some evidence of um, at least lipid-like spherules in the back of the eye of LXR knockout mice. Not to forget the choriocapillaris, on cross-section, we didn't see any differences in the overall morphology of the choriocapillaris, but with quick freeze deep edge, we were able to see it a little bit better. The, um, the left four panels are from wild-type mice and the right ones are from LXR knockout mice. Top row is low magnification, and then we're zooming in in the bottom row. And you can see that in the wild type mice, the fenestrae are present, they're present at a higher density, they have this wheel spoke like pattern. But when we look at the LXR alpha knockout mice, there are fewer, and um, it, there are areas where it looks like even uh, the, the spoke like pattern has been disrupted. And I'll point out at this point that etching these, uh, these um, tissues was really hard. And we think it's because of the, the abundance of volatiles and, and, and the abundance of lipids in, in these samples. Um, not to forget about inflammation because LXR has been shown to, to um, regulate inflammation. We also did flat mounts in our LXR knockout mice and looked at F480 positive cells. What we found was that in, in the posterior part at the subretinal, um, interface, there was an increase in F480 positive cells. And here you can just see some, the flat mounts in a little bit more detail, just for those of you who are interested in the morphology of the F480 positive cells. Um, this is the variety that we saw in our LXR knockout mice. Okay. Um, the last thing we did with this, uh, this group of mice was to look at the cytokine profile to get a little bit more information on whether or not the, um, the changes that are occurring are, are more are, are broader. And so we performed a cytokine array, and this is looking at 64 different cytokines. And we did find a difference in the expression of a number of these cytokines between the wild type and the LXR. Um, an example would be the IGFs, uh, several of the IGFs, as well as the MIPs. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is all, interesting and it, it relevant to AMD. The IGF, certainly they have been shown, polymorphisms of the IGF have been shown to be associated with advanced forms of AMD. So th this has given us a launching point to start looking into inflammation in, in greater detail. So what about therapy? I mean, our, our, our goal is hopefully to, to identify a signaling pathway and then go in for therapy. Well, there are two dilemmas that we had to tackle first. One was which agonist to test, because as I mentioned, the agonists behave differently depending on the tissue that, they're, that you're targeting, but also which animal model to use. So to, we did a quick and dirty assay to, to identify which um, agonist to use, and that was essentially to injure ourselves with a variety of traditional um, classical oxidants, if you will, versus lipids, and then look at uh, the lipid accumulation within these cells. And what we found was with the GW, at least, we saw a better decrease in the, the in intracellular lipid profile. So we decided we would stick with that since our primary endpoint was to look at changes at the level of lipids. Can it be used to remove lipids or improve the lipid profile of the posterior bulb. For the model, we, we turned to Jim Hanza um, and uh, basically took advantage of his ApoB100 mice. These are mice that express ApoB100. And you can see that there's accumulation of ApoB100 in um, the RP cell as well as below the RP cell at a very young age. And again, proof of principle, the idea was, does it have an impact on lipid accumulation? So these mice were ideal for, for the question that we were asking at the time. So here's our treatment paradigm. We took three month old ApoB100 mice. We fed, them a high fat, we fed them a low fat diet for five months or a low fat diet plus the agonist. We did a number of toxicology early studies looking at weights as well as um, their lipid profile and did not see a difference between the, the mice that were treated with the low fat diet versus the agonist. But interestingly, when we looked at pathology, 
Um, we did see that in the low fat diet, there seemed to be some stress on the retina and we're not sure why, but there was an increase in GFAP staining in the retina. Taking away the, um, uh, adding the agonist and activating the receptor caused a decrease in the GFAP immune reactivity. When we looked at ApoE accumulation um, below the RPE and within Brooks membrane, we saw that with the treatment of the agonist, there was a significant decrease in ApoE um, accumulation. When we looked at IBA1 positive cells as well as F480 positive cells, specifically focusing on the subretinal space, there was a decrease, but it did not reach significance. And this could partially be explained by the fact that we had few uh, mouse numbers at this point and we need to go back and increase our mouse numbers. And just to quickly look at pathology, the top row I'm showing you ApoB mice fed with the low fat diet versus those that were treated with the agonist. And what you can see is that there's some disruptions at the level of the um, basal side of the RPE. There is some minor um, a thickening, a, a Below the, uh, below the RPE and Brooks membrane. With the, with the treatment, however, there, it was a bit more normalized. However, there were still vacuoles, so the cells were certainly not perfectly normal. They just looked better. Now, since then, um, we have uh, acquired a seahorse in the lab, I'm pleased to say, so we're very excited to do some metabolism studies, and LXR has been shown to, um, to affect cell metabolism. So we, this is basically started because we looked at a, membrane, a mitochondrial membrane potential and we we're specifically comparing the two drugs that can activate the receptor, the GW versus the TO compound. And what we found was, whereas with the GW compound, if you injure with lipids or you lipid load your cells, you see a, an improvement with the GW compound. If you use the classical injury um, uh, drugs like a sodium, hydro, a sodium idate or a hydrogen peroxide, actually the TW compound, uh, the TO compound works better. And so um, we're really excited to, to dig, dig into that a little bit deeper and um, find out how LXR activity um, it can, be, it can affect cell metabolism. And I'm just showing you a couple of pictures from the low fat diet treated mice, so the diseased mice basically, and their mitochondria, it was really hard to image some of these mitochondria. And with the GW compounds, somehow we, we got better uh, morphology, but this has not been quantitated. So there's a lot more that's left to be done on this. So just to bring it all together, what we think is happening here is that LXR does in, in fact, in the RP in the posterior pole, um, regulate lipid metabolism and inflammation. Activation of the receptor can cause a decrease in ApoE accumulation below the RPE. It can improve um, the retinal uh, GFAP reactivity, decrease GFAP reactivity, and also potentially improve um, RPE cell function. But it's not just local, it can also uh, be driven through the circulation as been shown through the monocytes. And in, in fact, locally, those monocytes, if they become a resident or uh, they accumulate within the eye, these, the, the macrophages themselves can have an effect on inflammation. So let me just summarize this first part by saying that, you know, we think of nuclear receptors as being associated with um, endocrine organs, um, but there are an abundance of them in the eye. And so we can think of the eye as a secondary endocrine organ where these receptors play an important role. Um, I showed you some data on how we think LXR may be important in RP cell health and how in its absence, there's the accumulation of lipid particles um, and neutral lipid deposits, um, as well as changes in the immune profile of uh, the inflammatory profile of the posterior pole. So we think that these LXR knockout mice are going to be useful to investigating AMD pathogenesis a little bit more, specifically in the context of lipid dysregulation and inflammation, and that targeting them may be beneficial um, for AMD. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these nuclear receptors tend to um, crosstalk with each other and interact a lot. Uh, LXR uh, crosstalks and interacts with RXR. But we, we started looking at this and see to try and identify other nuclear receptors that may crosstalk and interact with LXR. And the rest of the study I'm going to show you, it was spearheaded by um, Peili Yao, who's now um, a program manager at NIHS. 
where basically she started looking at what the, the other nuclear receptors, and this was precipitated by a study that showed that LXR and another nuclear receptor called NER1 tend to um, crosstalk, and they can affect neuron development. So she did a simple, simple knockdown study where she knocked down the LXR and human RPE cells, young versus old, young, this is, a, a, I believe, from a 15-year-old versus a 93-year-old, and using two different um, siRNAs compared to the scrambled, looked at the expression of LXR alpha versus NER1, and found that when you knock down LXR, there's also a decrease in NER1. So then she said, well, let's look at NER1 in a little bit more detail. And just as background, NER1 is the nuclear receptor related protein one. It is an orphan nuclear receptor. So the ligand that can activate the receptor is not known. Um, however, there are a number of drugs that are available that can activate the, uh, the receptor quite efficiently and we can use as tools in the lab. And a lot of what I'm gonna show you is gonna be using IP7E as an activating ligand. It's been shown to regulate inflammation in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And again, it has a ligand binding domain and DNA binding domain. And it's uh, mechanistically, it drives, it's, it's driven either by activation of one in NER1, a homodimer, or a heterodimer with RXR. So the goals of the study were pretty straightforward, just to characterize the expression of NER1 as a function of age and disease, and then identify NER-based activities perhaps beyond what has been shown. Inflammation has been shown fairly um, extensively in other degenerative diseases, so we'll confirm that, but also is it doing anything else? So the first thing we did, again, is to take um, uh, human RP cells isolated from freshly donor eyes and look at the expression of NER1 as a function of age. And you can see that the expression decreases. When you zoom into that age range, the, it does decrease. But now we're getting into p-values that are not statistically significant. We looked at um, the expression of NER1 in RP chorate isolated from uh, wild type mice, C57 black 6J mice, comparing three month old to 24 month old, a similar trend can be seen here. And when we looked at the expression of NER1 in human primary RP cells, the highest level of NER1 was actually seen in our 15 year old cell line. And here I'm just showing you the protein distribution in a young cell line versus an old cell line. And then um, Western blots, again, demonstrating that at the level of both the um, RNA and protein, there's a decrease in NER1 with age. What about um, its distribution in human tissue? Well, here you can see NER1 is stained with gray, RG opsin with red. Uh, this is non-AMD at low mag and high mag, AMD tissue at low mag and high mag. What you can see here is that there's an abundance of NER1 in the RP cells in, um, in, in these uh, donor eyes. When we look at AMD tissue, however, there, there's less overlying this druse, this large confluent druse, and you can see drusen, and you can see that within it, there are again these cores that are immunoreactive from NER1. Looking at its binding partner, RxR, now RxR has been stained in, in red. What you can see is that RxR is distributed uh, uh, quite diffusely throughout the retina, but it's also present within the RPE cells that look, what look like to be in the nuclei. And here you can see, um, again, another druse, a uh, large druse that, that, that's presumably calcified, and um, NER1 is abundant within, within it. So, oh. The question is, what is the mechanism by which NER1 acts? And is there a difference between how it behaves in young versus old cells? So for this, we transfected our cells, our young and old cells, with a plasmid reporter that um, recognizes the NER1 response element. And we treated the cells, activated the receptor with IP70. We overexpressed the uh, NER1 in these cells as well, since the old cells have less of it. They're, they're not, it's not absent, it's just less of it. It's not quite as abundant as you see in the young. And what you can see here is when we activate the receptor, we get a nice increase in activity in the young and in the old. And it's even more so when we um, overexpress NER1. Interestingly, when we transfect these cells with the DR5, which will reflect RxR activity, we see an, a, a significantly higher level of activity um, in the young cells. 
but not as much in the old. And I wanna bring your attention to this Y axis. You can really see the difference. So this led us to conclude that, um, that at least in young cells, the activity of NER1 is driven by homodimerization, whereas in um, predominantly by homodimerization, while in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the old, it's driven by homodimerization, but in the young, it's driven by heterodimerization. And this is important because if we're trying to identify therapies, perhaps taking a multi-targeted uh, approach is important in this case to, to target both NER1 and RXR. And, and that is a big can of worms that I can talk about further, because RXR not only binds to NER1, but at least 17 other nuclear receptors. Okay, so one of the um, uh, functions associated with NER1 in liver fibrosis has been epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So we decided to see whether or not it plays a similar role in human RPE cells. And so we created this model system where we basically treated with TNF-alpha, and we looked at the morphology of our young and old cells. And you can see that compared to the control, when treated with TNF-alpha, these cells become elongated um, and, and take on a more mesenchymal phenotype. But the phenotype itself is not enough. So we looked at gene expression. We looked at um, E cadherin versus N cadherin and bimentin. And you can see that when treated with TNF alpha, there is a decrease in the E cadherin expression, increase in N cadherin as well as bimentin. And this is seen in the young. And in the old, it seems like the um, mesenchymal profile was more, uh, more prominent. So then the question became, what if we were to treat and activate the receptor? Whatever NER1 is there, whatever residual NER1, could it counter and change the epithelial to mesenchymal profile? And what we found indeed is if you compare the light gray to the black um, columns, this is the TNF alpha treated versus the IP7E, you can see that in the young, there is an increase in e-coherent expression. There is um, a decrease in the n coherent and a decrease in the bimentin expression. And again, you can see a similar pattern in the old cells. And I'm just showing you some Western blots where we looked at e-coherin at the protein level treated with TNF-alpha. There's a significant decrease, but with the IP70, you get a nice increase in its expression. This is seen in both young and old. So looking at um, potential therapy, and what, what is the effect, not just on the gene expression, but on the morphology of the cells. Here you can see cells that have been treated with TNF-alpha versus the IP7E, and the cell, cells look improved. They, they're not perfect, but they look improved. This is also seen in the old cells. Interestingly enough, if we overexpress NER1, that by itself is sufficient to improve the morphology of the cell. So here's NER1 overexpression treated with TNF alpha, and you can already see the cells look a little bit better. If we do with IP7E, still a little bit better. And this is also seen in the old cells. So with this in mind, and given that um, NER1 has been associated with an improved improved immune profile and it could potentially um, affect the RPE integrity, we decided to look at neuron activation as potential therapy for AMD. So we used the liver X alpha receptor knockout mice and um, the treatment paradigm was to treat with IP7E dissolved in tween for 14 days twice a day by oral gavage. We did um, pre-treatment uh, pre retinal function assessments and imaging as well as post-treatment. And at this point, we, we were getting a little bit better at doing our talk studies. So we looked at all the organs that we think NER1 might affect, including the liver, the brain, and the spleen, as well as body weight. And we did not see a difference between um, these measurements pre and post treatment. Here you can see in vivo imaging um, before the treatment. This is the control after the treatment, IP7E before the treatment and after the treatment. So looking at retinal function, we really didn't see a difference in the scotopic A wave and B wave amplitudes. However, when we looked at the photopic A wave and B wave amplitudes at the higher flesh intensities, there seemed to be an improvement. And just to, to orient everybody, the um, purple squares are the IP7E treated versus the circles, which are the controls. We looked at C waves and it seemed like the most um, improvement was actually seen at the level of the C wave um, with the IP70 treatment. Looking at NER1 um, activation and how it may affect 
pathology of the LXR alpha knockout mice. I'm just showing you four examples of TEM from four different mice. And you can see the variety of pathologies that we saw. We saw everything from disruptions in the um, basal infoldings to RP cells that did not look healthy to vacuolization. And we can talk about vacuolization. Vacuolization, uh, you know, is not necessarily seen in human AMD um, samples. However, you know, in, in mice, it, it, is an, it, it is a reflection of RP cells that are not healthy. And also, we don't know if these are lipid loaded, one, one can assume that some of them are lipid loaded because this is an LXR knockout mouse. When we did the IP7E treatment, there was an improvement in the basal infoldings. You still saw some microvacuolization and macrovacuolizations on occasion, but overall the morphology of the RP cells looked a bit healthier. We tried to quantitate this and looked at a variety of histological parameters. Here you can see um, basically this tabulated and control versus IP7E. And some of the categories that we looked at, photoreceptor degeneration, RP degeneration, Brooks membrane thickening. And, and there was an overall improvement. I'll bring your attention to the, the integrity of the, the basal side of the RP as well as deposit formation where IP7E seemed to have a, an important effect. Looking at NER1 accumulation, uh, looking at the effect of NER1 on inflammation and immune cells in the LXR knockout mouse, um, we looked at flat mounts and we did count the F480 positive cells and saw that there was a decrease in the F480 positive cells at the subretinal interface. Um, we also looked at the distribution of F480 positive cells as well as IBA positive cells in the retina versus the choroid. In the choroid, we did not detect any significant differences, but in the retina, we did see a decrease in both F480 positive cells um, and IBA1 positive cells, suggesting that the activation of NER1 is having an effect on uh, the um, immune profile of these, um, these mice. And finally, we looked at accumulation of lipids in the posterior pole, looking at APOE deposition, again, at below the RP and within Brooks membrane, IP70 seemed to improve that significantly. There was also an improvement in EO6, although it wasn't completely gone. And with regards to APOB, we really did not see any significant difference in the staining pattern between the um, NER1 activated versus the LXR alpha knockout without treatment, without um, a vehicle treated. So just to summarize this part, um, we see that NER1 expression in RP cells decreases as a function of age, that they're immunopositive cores that are found in large drusen. Um, and we believe that the, the activity of the receptor actually varies with age, with um, the activity driven mostly by homodimerization in the old cells, whereas it's um, driven primarily by heterodimerization in the young cells. Um, and we also identified a, a NER1 based a target potentially, and that is EMT. So right now we're in the process of testing that out in a model of e in vivo and a model of EMT. So I was given 45 minutes and I just wanna end on a final thought. And that is um, more of a philosophical discussion. And this is about the utility of animal models because I presented um, several animal models during this, uh, during this talk. Uh, inevitably, when I go to meetings or when I talk to my colleagues, I oftentimes um, hear ultimately, but there's really no good model of the AMD. And, and what I want to challenge is that concept of what do we mean by good? We know that AMD is a multifactorial disorder, so uh, multifaceted, multiple um, risk factors. And we've seen, based on the animal models, that you can take a combination of these risk factors and put them together in an animal model and cause injury to the RP cell that may manifest in AMD pathologies. So when somebody says it's not a good model, my question is, what, what, do, what are they looking for? Are they looking for a mouse model that um, all the risk factors that have been associated with AMD have been taken into account or that it shows all the pathological changes that have been reported for AMD in the mouse? And I would say that in a mouse, that that's probably not possible, never say never, but it's probably not possible. And also more importantly, I don't think there's a human being that's walking around. So we don't have a human model. Um, so, so having that expectation is gonna be quite challenging. And what I would argue is that there, right now, there are a number of really good models out there and we should be using them and using them as platforms to test potential therapies, but we should be asking the right question. If you want a model that, uh, 
target, and you want to target lipids, then get a model where there's lipid dysregulation. If you want to target inflammation, then get a model where it's been shown to uh, have changes in the immune profile. So I think there's a lot of utility already with some of the animal models that are out there. And again, it's just a philosophical comment on models. With that, I wanna end by thanking all the people who really did the work. Here's Mayer again and Pei Li, everybody in the lab. I tried to um, thank everybody as we were going through the talk. Um, you know, the, the Tome Foundation uh, started the LXR story before it went to NEI and the Mildred Reeves Foundation started the NER1 study before it went to NEI, so I'm grateful for that. And with that, I, am, um, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, okay, I drop it in chat uh, and note that you have one. Um, okay, let's start with Dorota. Uh, hi, Goldis. It was amazing, and I really like how you connected to nuclear receptors um, and how obviously they must be interconnected together with others. So I asked my question in the chat um, Have you looked at the LXR translocation to the nucleus? And uh, um, did you consider also that it might be circadian rhythm regulated? And uh, well, uh, this this is actually a whole question. I know you can you can uh, answer your way. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Dorota. Um, so we have not looked in culture whether or not activating the receptor you see actually physical translocation of the LXRs. Um, and it's something that we need to do. In particular, we, we just started doing that with the NER1 and the other NR4 family members. We're looking at NER77 as well. So stay tuned on that. Um, it, it could be that, uh, just to speculate, it could be that you can have um, turnover of the LXR fast enough that you may or may not see it. But I don't know, so we'll have to see. But I know that's been reported for many of these nuclear receptors. Um, HR is a good example. Trying to pin that down and actually show that it translocates to the nucleus has been very difficult. With regards to circadian pattern, it certainly could play a role. We've tried to be rigorous about this with regards to when we collect our tissue and try and doing it at the same time point. We generally collect our tissue between 10 and 12. And we, we try not to you know, sway from that too much, but we haven't looked at it and it's something that would be really interesting to do. So yeah, I don't know yet about that. And uh, just a little comment to that, because you mentioned that RxR seems to be nuclear um, and actually that's, that's kind of known, right? That RxR um, is one of those that stays nuclear and only activates the, the targets when the other partner comes. So that's uh, very consistent with this notion. Yes. Um, and, and so I, I think earlier I, I was mentioning it more in terms of the canonical pathway being that you have your receptor that sits in the cytoplasm upon, you know, diffusion of the ligand, then it can separate from its chaperone and translocate through the nucleus. But there are exceptions to that. And RxR is a really good example of that where it actually sits in the nucleus and the ligand has to get there to the nucleus. Thank you. Hey, I, I have a great news for Tati. You will not be the one who give the final comments. Today will be Dan Zak. But before we go to Dan, uh, we have a question from Aisha. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, Malak. Very nice talk. Uh, I have uh, several questions uh, regarding the uh, your work. Most of the time, when you look at the uh, the AMD, let's say marker, you look at uh, ORIDO, which is uh, a neutral lipid, right? But uh, uh, how about cholesterol? Because we know in AMD, at least sixty percent of the lipid are cho is cholesterol. Right, right. So that's a great question. And there is a really good stain for that philippin where you can um, manipulate it so you can look at either unesterified or, unest or esterified cholesterol. I will say that for whatever reason in our hands, philippin works really beautifully in human samples, but we've not been able to get it to work really well in mice. And um, talking to other people who've also looked at this, I get the sense that there is some variability with that. 
we just have to figure it out. So we've not been able to do that. Again, in, in humans, it works beautifully. Um, yeah. And we've been able to do that quite well. Talk to me. I can help you with that. Okay, good. I will. Thank you. Philip, and the unnecessary cholesterol is, is so easy, but there is a few things that you have to pay attention to. Acidified cholesterol is a little bit trickier. Okay. It can be done if the protocol is right. Okay, good, good. I will be in touch. Thank you so much. And the other thing is uh, the accumulation of APOE. So is this a surprising? Because I know that uh, in all those uh, sections that you showed, there is uh, obstruction in the RPE uh, photoreceptor region. And the uh, IPOE coming from the circulation, it needs those uh, transporters to get into the retina. So is it uh, surprising? No, it's not. And in fact, part of the reason we, we are looking at APOE is because APOE has been shown to be present in human drusen, right? So that, that's part of the reason. It's more a co confirmation of um, the validity of our, our pathology that we're looking at APOE. APOE is a cholesterol carrier. So yeah, no, any of these apolipoproteins would be useful to look at. Last thing, if I'm, I, I might, you know, uh, for uh, APOE knockout mice, it was shown that, you know, even the, when you knock out the APOE, there is a massive accumulation of uh, lipid and cholesterol, and yet there is no abnormality in uh, the structure. Yes, yes. There, there, there are a number of really good APOE knockout studies or APOE Leiden stories um, out there, that, and there's obviously the APOE um, targeted replacement mouse model, but you're absolutely right. There wasn't bona f a bona fide um, deposit, uh, um, concentrated accumulation of material below the RPE. The nice talk. Thank you. Hey, let's move to Karim. Uh, yes, hi. Wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I have a quick question. I know that you, you've tested a, a couple of drugs in, in specific models, but have you tried mixing and matching the drugs, even though, you know, the, the specific model didn't have the mutation, just as a curiosity? Yeah, no, and we'd love to do that. And that actually uh, harkens back to the statement that, you know, one of the reasons perhaps we don't have, we haven't made as much um, progress on therapies is because we've been so focused on one, one particular, you know, targeting one particular uh, uh, factor. So we would love to do that. We would love to do a combination potentially of targeting the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is a receptor that can be activated by toxins. Um, as well as, for example, the liver X receptor, or even with the NER1. So that, that's something that we would love to do, yes. But we haven't done it yet. Thank you. All right, let's move to Vice Chairman Vladimir. Hey, Golis, thank you for the great talk. A quick question. In the, you show that uh, in humans with AMD, you see a reduction in LXR. And I noticed in the section that you show that it was still quite high in the cones, but reduced in the rods. I was wondering whether you would care to comment on that and whether that's something that is just a fluke or it's a consistent observation. No, and it's, uh, it's actually less, it's still there, but it's less than what you see in, in the non-AMD. In the non-AMD, it's abundant in the inner segments. I mean, you see it in the cones, you see it even in the rod inner segments. But for whatever reason, in the AMD, it's it's muted. It's much less. There are actually cones that are not stained as positively and as strongly as the other ones. We would love to see what's going on at the level of the photoreceptors and, and try and tap into that a little bit more. We, we haven't quite worked out the logistics of how to do that, um, maybe because we're so culture oriented and there are no cultures for um, photoreceptors. Um, but yeah, we would we would love to. So it's still it's still there, but it's muted. The expression is less in humans. Maybe a quick follow up. Have you looked at fovea versus peripheral regions, and do you see a gradient in reduction? That is a, a great question, and I'm embarrassed to say that we have not. And the reason I'm embarrassed to say that is because part of my graduate career was looking at the macular versus the periphery. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll definitely get okay. at that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Alex. Yeah, hi, this is Alex from Dr. Francesca. Lab. I have a question about the uh, lipid accumulation in RPE that you showed. 
So at the same time, did you look at the some changes in lipids in the RP? Uh, sorry, in the retina related to this accumulation. I mean, is it possible that this lipids accumulate in RPE and at the same time, for example, they are not uh, transported to further to the retina? I know you showed this oil red O staining, so. That's one way of looking at it, but I was wondering more about maybe some decrease in some lipids related to the accumulation in the RP. Right. So, so that's a great question. Thank you for that. We, um, we started a lipidomic study, um, and unfortunately, the results are still inconclusive. But we, we have a collaboration. We're looking at lipidomics. Um, there was some complication in technique in how the, the samples were collected. They were collected on a plastic petri dish. For those of you interested, please never do that. Do it only on glass. So um, I don't have the answer to that yet. What I can say with regards to the oil red O staining itself is that nothing really stood out to us as being significantly different. But that's only looking at oil red O, which targets neutral, which um, uh, reveals neutral lipids, basically. Hey. Yes, hello. Um, so you presented some pretty compelling evidence uh, implicating NER1 in AMD pathology, and your discussion was primarily focused on its expression in the RPE. And I was wondering if you uh, considered other retinal cell types and the role of NER1 expression uh, in those cell types. Yeah. So that, that's the next stage. We're really interested in um, its role in the immune cells in the retina because there's enough evidence that these NR4A re uh, receptors um, play a significant regulatory role in macrophages and monocytes. Um, so, so we'll be looking at that. Uh, I right now have a postdoctoral fellow who's joined the lab, um, Tenu Parmer, and she, that's her, her focus right now is to look at the other cells in the retina. Um, so yeah, we, we haven't looked at it in detail just yet. We focus, we do live a little bit in an RP-centric world, second to um, a choroidal endothelial-centric world, and finally a ret retina-centric world. So, so we'll be looking at that soon. All right, uh, God is doing a wonderful conversation. Unfortunately, Don Zak was afraid of asking and commenting on your presentation. Uh, we will make a note of that. I uh, will send him uh, some FedEx uh, with comments. So why not we stick to um, Johns Hopkins and maybe we go to Seth Black Show. Seth, are you there? I don't know what happened to this uh, in the university. Maybe they're shutting down or something. I don't know. All right, if not, then we go to Aparna for final comments. Nobody wants to speak. That's okay. Oh, I, I'm here. I just walked into my office. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the spot, Chris. Um, Golders, that was a really fantastic talk. I have a quick question, actually. Do you have any idea about um, what is the trigger for decreasing the expression of these nuclear hormone receptors? No, I would love to answer that. And, you know, for a long time, it seemed like the pattern we were seeing was a decrease, a decrease, a decrease, until we came across uh, this other receptor that we're looking at, which is the estrogen-related receptor. And interestingly enough, it increases. So it renewed our faith in um, that this isn't just the similar pattern that you see across the board for all nuclear receptors, um, and that there is perhaps a rhyme and reason to it. Um, I will say that what will be interesting is someday to put up a board, kind of like a crime board where you have all of your receptors up there and you're, you're basically um, connecting them and create this, this pattern. Um, and we're not there yet, but uh, we hope to do that in the future. So my answer is, unfortunately, I don't know why, but I do know that at least not all of them are decreasing with age. Okay, that's, again, really beautiful work, beautiful story, and thank you so much for making my Commute to work so lovely today. Thanks, Colin. Thank you, Aparna. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I will see you next week, the same place, the same time. Uh, the only difference will be yet another wonderful speaker as we have today.